lovely folks over at Harris Labs. We've got uh, Eli Silver and Daniel Harris here with us today who work in Harris Labs. Um, it might be shocking to hear named after Daniel Harris. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to hear all about their work in the lab. So welcome, folks. Thank you. Um, is everything working? You can hear us OK? Yep. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Incredible. Um, so yeah, so I'll give a brief introduction, just a little bit about my background, and then we'll hand it off to a lot of the team members to show their various projects, including Eli. So, um, so yeah, as promised, I'm I'm Dan Harris. I'm the PI of the lab here. I've been at Brown for about seven years, um, and our research expertise is in in fluid mechanics, um, and we do a lot of what, what some people would call tabletop experiments. Um, so a lot of very hands-on things. We do a lot of iteration and making, and so we'll have an opportunity at the end, hopefully, to tour some of our kind of maker space within the lab where we do a ton of prototyping and, and iteration. Um, but yeah, my background is in um, mechanical engineering and applied math. So we're interested in problems in, in, in fluid mechanics. Um, and so run a physical lab and do a lot of experiments. Um, and so my evolution into this space, and of course the lab has um, grown since then. And of course, lucky to have Eli, who's on the, the team here, who's been an active contributor to, to OSHA for a while and attended a number of the summits. Um, previously and hopefully hopefully many more um, so it really helped us get more and more integrated into this formal community um, but informally uh, as part of my some of my graduate work i was developing uh looking at droplet impacts so this is things that, um so droplets that might impact you know a, 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 an aircraft wing or um uh or even you know raindrops impacting the the wings of a um, mosquito you know anything like that where droplets impact and so we needed a way to generate these droplets in a repeatable manner um, and so there's a lot of, in the academic literature, there's a lot of people that had studied these sorts of things before, but not really the technology out there that could be easily reproduced. Um, so everyone had their different, a different solution to this particular problem. And so the way I kind of got interested in this space was writing up a, an academic paper on the device that I had developed um, as a graduate student, uh, and really organically over time, learning that at least so far, that was probably, it's the thing I'm contacted most about because it's useful. And it wasn't necessarily the innovation um, that was put into it, because some parts were innovative. Many were kind of uh, barred from private previous work with, with citations. But I think the difference was trying to share as much of the content to make it easily reproducible as possible. And so it went beyond just being another academic paper in this lineage, but actually something that that people could use um, and get started immediately. So I think you know there's probably at least 100 different labs that, uh, and, and um, universities that have recreated this device. So that was kind of our uh, a starting point for me that realized that I think we can do better in science by not only publishing the scientific results and making sure those are open, but the the hardware surrounding that that oftentimes is is specific to the problem that you're looking at, um, just to make science more reproducible, open, and really accessible. And and the kind of birth of maker spaces and the DIY uh, movement that continues to grow, I think, really fosters that spirit and and helps uh, democratize science. Um, so that was one example we'll show the kind of current version of that droplet generator that Eli's really taken from uh, uh, over the past several years and, and add a lot of cool functionality to it as well as an example. Um, another thing um, I'll mention very briefly um, that kind of uh, led us into to more and more thinking about this space is uh, at the start of the pandemic, um, uh, I joined uh, our lab joined forces with Manu Prakash, which I'm sure many of you know, and it was a fellow of this uh, organization recently. Um, as well as Kai Cook, who is a, a clinician at the University of Utah, uh, working on an open source um, uh, ventilator design. Uh, and we actually had some success with that over the, the kind of first year of the pandemic. Some uh, units were manufactured um, in India and went, underwent some um, clinical testing and that sort of thing. And so learned a lot through that experience, um, working with Manu, who is, of course, one of the, the leaders in this space, but also the real challenges associated with um, open source um, uh, uh, medical devices. And I think that's something we came up into a, a lot of challenges and I think is a perhaps an open question that um, I think a lot of people are exploring is, is how to transcend maybe science or uh, craft or art, um, but looking at the medical space. Um, so that's something I'm interested in um, and had a little bit of experience in. Um, and so the, uh, and I could sh yeah, share the screen real quick. Thanks Eli. Cool. 
Yeah, and so just um, not to take too much more time so I can hand it over to the to the group, um, but I just wanted to, if you're interested in kind of how we approach this and some of our projects, um, so on our lab website, um, uh, we have a, a link, a tab for the hardware projects. Um, and so there's a number here, a few that we'll have time to discuss today. Um, our most recent one was this Open Flume project, which was rather ambitious. Um, and Eli will will take the uh, has taken the lead on that project, and we'll describe it. That was one of our uh, certified projects um, in the lab. Um, the drop generator, as I mentioned, um, we've had some fun with microfluidics, which is manufacturing channels that are kind of at the micron and, and above scale. So uh, with wisps, like kind of on the order of the a human hair. Um, and so traditional manufacturing process are very expensive, um, can be time consuming and dangerous. Um, so we worked on a technique refining using a craft cutter or a, a cricket type device um, to actually manufacture these, to, again, to, in, the, in the interest of making iteration more um, uh, efficient, but also uh, the technology is more accessible. Um, John, who's in our lab, will talk about this vibration labs, lab kit, which was uh, when we fully went remote um, during the pandemic for teaching, uh, I felt it was still really important for students to have some uh, hands-on physical experience. So we developed, uh, rather than a traditional lab, a lab kit that could be um, distributed to all the students. And so they could do a physical experiments um, at home and we still, we still use that in teaching. Um, and a couple other devices. And then some of our smaller, um, kind of more one-off projects, uh, we highlight on our instructors page. So we have a few of them um, here, including a fun one, which is, um, based on some of our research, but we use for a lot of outreach now, which is this uh, surfer bot, which is essentially a hex bug that surfs on the fluid, uh, uh, on, the, on the surface of water um, by exciting its own waves. And so I have kind of a kit for that um, as well. And again, we use that for a lot of our outreach efforts locally in uh, Providence and and uh, and otherwise. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Eli. So he, he'll show a little bit of, um, so we'll start with the droplet generator project since that kind of had uh, important historical um, origins in our lab. Um, so he'll show some of the latest stuff he's done and take take you over to Chase who's been running experiments with the droplet, the latest version of the droplet generator that we're about to um, release and hopefully get approved um, uh, through, this or through the organization. Uh, and then briefly we'll walk over to John who will show us uh, some of the um, educational hardware that I mentioned and some recent additions that we're working on now um, with some custom PCB work to instrument our, our device, uh, the educational device. Um, and then Eli will wrap us up with some of the open flume um, stuff and the methodology there, um, gave a nice talk recently about that and we'll share some of those slides. Uh, and then with the time we have left, um, take you around the lab and show our, our, our workspace and everything. Um, but yeah, thanks for everyone who's watching um, and feel free to reach out uh, with any feedback or ideas or, or collaborations. Um, and we're hoping to kind of continue to, to grow this space in academia, um, which I think uh, could have really important implications for reproducibility in science and, and accessibility in general. So with that, I'll hand it over to the master, Eli. Cool, thanks, Dan. Um, so before I start, if you have questions or, or want more information on any of this, feel free to drop a comment in the chat and I'll try to answer those as we go. Um, let me, that is really annoying. So, oh, did you want to show the puffer fish? Oh, are we still oh. sharing the screen? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can briefly. Yeah, so this was just um, kind of a quick, you know, not a whole lot to it, but uh, one slide overview of that, our, our kind of uh, uh, attempt at open source medical hardware with uh, the Prakash lab at, at Stanford. Um, with some of our industrial partners that actually manufactured the device um, in India. And so we had a, quite a diverse team from electronics to the mechanical and pneumatic side of things, um, as well as the user interface. Um, so that was one of the, I think, key features that we found out that's, that stood out about uh, our particular project. And and because uh, as you, you, you may be aware, there were probably hundreds of these various uh, efforts, um, but we took uh, work uh, 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 very early on working with clinicians um, and getting that user feedback to make sure not only is this thing going to perform to specs, but that uh, it's relatable and, and kind of easy to use. Um, and so that helped us get it more quickly into to the hands of clinicians um, during that time period. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, so the droplet generator. So just to highlight one of one of the open hardware projects that, as Dan mentioned, has has been replicated now um, at labs around the world because of how useful it is and hopefully how easy to build it is. 
Um, so the droplet generator is, we use it for oil and water droplets. And it's difficult to make droplets that are smaller than um, about a millimeter is, is kind of the, the smallest size that you can reliably make with the traditional method, which is to drip fluid through a syringe needle or something like that. And um, when you have this like standard drip feed system where you get like drip, 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 uh, when you use that to make droplets, surface tension means that the surface tension causes the droplets to be much larger than the diameter of the syringe orifice. So the, the needle, um, even if the needle is really small, the droplets can tend to be quite large. And so the way that this droplet generator works is it actually uses a piezo disc, similar to like the buzzer in your computer or something like that. Um, and it uses the, the deformation of the piezo to eject a small volume of fluid through a nozzle. And the original prototype was machined out of a, a piece of aluminum and had to have a very precise nozzle, nozzle drilled um, or bored out. And then later prototypes used uh, like a form labs resin printer to, um, to, to create the whole device. And for the last about year, year and a half, we've been working on a, uh, a version that uses FDM 3D printing. So we print it on, we've, we've done on like Prusas and Bamboo Labs printers. Um, and the printer isn't able to get the resolution that you need to make the nozzle, but printers have nozzles and you can buy nozzles in all these different sizes um, just from places where you would get printer parts in general. And uh, so one of the things that um, that I think a collaborator came up with was this idea of using 3D printer nozzles for the device, which means that the, the most critical dimension we're now buying instead of making. And then the rest of it we can make with uh, normal, uh, normal printed parts. So this is what the droplet generator looks like. It has a, uh, there's the printer nozzle, there's a removable head because you have to take it out to bleed the air bubbles out of the system. Um, the piezo disc sits right at the top here. And then there's a reservoir. And this bracket is designed such that the lip of the reservoir is, when it's brim full, is at the same height as the nozzle. And so that means that it's not kind of siphoning fluid one way or the other. Um, and so we have an integrated like uh, flexure design in, uh, for the for this piece that allows you to, to level it and get everything working. Um, so yeah, maybe you can show how some of this stuff works. So we have a custom PCB and we walk through the whole process of um, uploading your designs or our designs to JLC PCB to get them manufactured. And um, this will be officially out very soon. Uh, how to flash the how to flash the system, and then um, let's see where we have the assembly stuff. Oh, assembly of three D printed parts. So there's a bomb, and then we walk through um, how to build the whole device. So. Yeah, without further ado, um, if I may ask the moderators, ho oh, ho, stop sharing. Is it possible to switch to the, the second, second camera? camera? Have? Oh, oh wow. wow. Look at that. Look at that. Is it going to work? Okay, okay, so now I can walk over and have Chase give a demo of the, uh, of the system. I might mute this guy. All right, this is Chase Gabbard. Hi, right, so you know, I just told you about the droplet generator. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick like demo of it actually being used within the lab. Um, so if we look at the, the drop generator, you can see a lot of the components that he just mentioned. You have the reservoir, you have a detachable head here. Um, so when you're trying to run this, you have to take this head off and, and bleed it to prime the system. Uh, and then it's pretty simple after that. You have software. Um, so you have this page. And what we're going to do is just run uh, a single drop and bounce it here. So what are we looking at? So you're looking at a glass slide, 
which has been coated with a thick silicone oil. And what that allows us to do is actually bounce these small drops off of the interface. And one thing that you'll notice pretty clearly with the, with the video that Eli's taken is these drops are so small, they're actually pretty hard to see. So I'm gonna show you over here uh, a high speed video of that drop, which will allow you to get a better visual. So you can see these drops are able to bounce off the, the interface um, and we're able to use that droplet generator to generate these drops, which are much, much smaller than have been uh, previously studied. Uh, and so now we're, we're moving into trying to see how the droplet generator performs when you change fluid properties, viscosity, make, make it work with the more complex fluids. But uh, it's, a, it's a really neat fluids challenge to manufacture drops this small. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK, I think next we're going to John to show off our vibrations demo kit. Um, so John, take it away. All right. Hello. I'm John. I'm a grad student in this lab. Um, and I'm going to be show, showing something that was developed for one of Professor Harris's courses, um, which is a lab kit that the students can take home. So this was developed by a couple other students in our lab who have since graduated. Um, it was during COVID when Professor Harris was teaching his uh, mechanical vibrations course, um, but because of the pandemic, students couldn't you know, go into the course lab space and do the, the hands-on lab component of the course. Um, and so they developed you know, a very low cost and easy to replicate system that they could make a bunch of and send home with the students so they could get some hands-on experience learning the concepts in the course. Um, so the idea with this system, there's a frame that's laser cut out of some material. Um, and then there's just a regular speaker attached to the top. And yeah, that looks good. And then to the end of the speaker, there's this spring mass system. So there's a couple of coil springs attached to uh, nuts. And this is kind of a canonical system in vibrations of, you know, some masses separated by some springs. Um, and so by, you know, playing a waveform through the speaker, you can vibrate the whole system. And there's also a, a visualization component of the lab. So what they would be doing is exciting the system at different frequencies with the speaker. And then there's a, a strobe light, which you can flash at a slightly detuned frequency. And through, you know, aliasing and persistence of vision, what you see is the difference in frequency. So you get a really slow motion um, visual of how the system is vibrating. And so this system has been released on our lab's GitHub. And I think there's a paper in an open hardware journal about it also. Yeah, the Journal of Open Hardware has a full write-up of the how the system was designed and the, the way that we run the course, as well as links to how to build this if you're an educator and, and want to teach mechanical vibrations using the system. Yep. Um, and so the system was developed previously by other people, but this semester, Eli and I have been working on developing a board to drive the whole system that we're calling the Vibe Check. Um, and it's based on an STM32 microcontroller. Um, it has an audio output that we can use to drive the speaker with different waveforms. Um, and it does the, you know, waveform synthesis on the microcontroller. Um, and it also has a ring of very bright LEDs around the outside so that we can get this strobing effect for the visualization. And one of the new components that we're working on adding is um, a quantitative element to the lab. So there's these ports where we can connect daughter boards with MEMS accelerometers. Um, and these are super cheap. They're like the cell phone LSM6 DS3 accelerometer by ST, and they're like 80 cents or something. So you can get a ton of these little 
daughter boards and we've glued a magnet on the back so they can stick them you know to different parts of the system um, and then they plug into the main board and we'll be able to get you know measurements of the acceleration of all the different parts of the system and we're still working on you know developing the firmware for this um, can we try to strobe it yeah Live demo. Yeah, I'm not sure that the strobing will come across very well on video because there's another aliasing happening. Why don't we, um, I'll do the fling, and then we can come back to this when we do the lab tour. How about that? Oh, it's going to work. Oh, it's going to work. Yeah. I just had the amplitude set too low. Okay, so that's... So if I just illuminate it with a, with a flashlight, you can see... Oh, that's bright. Um, that it looks blurry and you don't actually, it doesn't look like it's happening in slow motion. There's no aliasing effect happening. Okay. Ready for the strobe? Yeah. So hopefully you can see that. Um, so the, the kind of blips of bright that are shooting up the screen is part of the rolling shutter effect of the camera, but by eye you totally see the system as if it were in slow motion. And again, that's just by detuning the frequency of the strobe with the frequency of the speaker. Yep. So right now we're exciting this, the uh, system with a 34 hertz sine wave, and then the strobe is flashing at 33 hertz. So we're seeing, you know, the vibration slow down to one hertz. Cool. Thanks, John. Yep. Um, Okay, if possible, I would like to switch back to the main camera. Um, okay, so, uh oh, what just happened? So, the next project we'd like to highlight is Open Flume, which is so far the only project that we've certified um, as open source in the lab. Would you mind turning off your audio? Thanks. Um, with hopefully more to come. Share screen. Entire screen. Okay. So Open Flume was designed uh, for a specific research need in the lab, um, and. The experiment that we designed it for was focusing on drag at the interface. So um, here's a, a kind of schematic image of the way that the experiment was run. You have a uniform flow, in this case going from right to left, and then we place a spherical object into the flow, excuse me, and move it up and down and measure the drag forces on it. So um, flumes, which is just a fancy word for like a flow tank or an infinite infinity pool, kind of a, a research system. Um, when you ask a, a, a fluids researcher what a flume would look like, this is the picture that they would likely have in their head. So these are huge, often multi-million dollar facilities um, with uh, a, that are very large and are not really built for the type of experiment that we wanted to conduct, which was much smaller scale at the interface. Um, so, for instance, the, the surface waves on a flume this big are likely larger than the objects that we're trying to measure. So, um, we looked at flumes are used uh, not just in our experiment, but in all different areas of research into fluids. Um, and there are commercial devices for these smaller desktop scale flumes, but they're typically marketed as educational tools. And um, they have curriculums associated with them, and they, and they kind of have a series of example experiments but they don't have the type of rigorous characterization of the flow characteristics that we needed to be confident that it would be um, useful for our experiment. And so they also tend to be on the order of $10,000. Uh, so expensive and not well characterized. And so this motivated us to design our own flume in-house, which um, has some 
added uh, flow conditioning features to hopefully make it better for our experiment. And then we used the fluid measurement tools that we have in the lab to fully characterize it and release that. And then we designed it with um, modularity and uh, low cost accessible principles in mind. So you can see that the whole flume costs about $1,000 um, to build uh, if you ignore the, the time it takes an undergrad to assemble it. So um, a brief overview of the paper that we published. Uh, I've already mentioned that we were using this to measure drag and interface. Um, but what we actually found during this, during this paper, uh, during these experiments was that the drag characteristics change dramatically depending on the sphere material. So whether it's hydrophilic or hydrophobic and whether you're entering like going from air to water or exiting, like going from water to air, uh, there's multiple different types of, of force curves that you might see. So this is indicative of some sort of like hysteresis or a history dependent uh, behavior of the system where whether the sphere is already wetted changes the force that you would measure than if it's dry when, when at that level in the interface. And the other really striking feature is that, um, so if we look at this plot right here, um, so the free stream drag is something that's well known in fluids and has been, you know, was characterized a long time ago, but this is the fully submerged, like, like the sphere is deep under the surface, the drag that you would expect to measure. And so you might expect that when the, when the sphere is half submerged, you get half of the force. Um, and that might be true for really large objects, but it turns out in this case that because of surface tension playing an effect, we can get drag forces that are two, three, even four times the, the full submerged drag because of the deformation of the surface. And so this was an unexpected result that, um, that was, we could only kind of do these measurements because of the facility that we built. So the first version of the flume, uh, we had already intended to make it open source. So we designed the entire thing to be laser cut uh, out of clear acrylic and used that as our manufacturing process. Um, we 3D printed a lot of the like um, barb fittings and things like that used in the project. But we actually found that trying to build a large tank like this out of laser cut acrylic doesn't work very well. There was significant cracking that caused leaks for the entire time that we were using this, this flume. Um, and the cracks are caused by the heat that's put into the material during the laser cutting process. And then you add the solvent to weld the acrylic together. And that releases these stresses in the material that cause cracks to propagate. Um, another big problem is that we can only laser cut material that's so thick. And so kind of all of these things working together meant that we were able to do these experiments with the flume, but it wasn't an ideal solution. And we were always chasing leaks. And so that's why when we wanted to put out an open hardware uh, project based around the flume, we decided to kind of start from scratch and design the flume that we wish we had two years ago. Um, so some, some things that are different about this are um, none of the parts that are, none of the functional parts are laser cut. They're actually all built using wood shop tools. So a table saw, and a like a router and things like that drill press um and so while this doesn't lend itself as much to the traditional like digital fabrication makerspace there are makerspaces and have been for you know well before 3d printers were ubiquitous that have the capabilities to build something like this and so uh we were we hope that by using this more traditional tool set we can actually maintain accessibility or even increase accessibility in terms of where this object could be built um, so some features of it are, there's the, the flume body, which is made of this, uh, much thicker acrylic. And there's, a, an electronics component that includes a microcontroller and a, and a pump. And then there's the pump itself, which I'll talk a little bit about, but, um, we also moved away from 3d printed fittings because they just kept cracking. And so by going to off the shelf, um, fittings, it may add a little bit of cost, but it removes a lot of time printing and things. And then the flume has been much more reliable since, since going to these off the shelf fittings. Um, so how did we build 
a large acrylic tank in a wood shop? The answer is by choosing the correct cutting tools um, for the processes that we were using. So buying a plexiglass and plastics specific blade that has a, a low rake angle and a lot of teeth produces cuts on acrylic that you can glue straight away. And so again, this is like a small low cost change from the traditional table saw blade to something that's designed for plastics that completely changes the type of materials that we can work with in the workshop. Um, another example is these ac acrylic specific uh, drill bits. And uh, if you use plastics and haven't tried a set of these, um, you can either purchase a set of drill bits that are meant for plastics, or you can actually modify drill bits with like a Dremel tool to make them better for plastics. It's really, really amazing because you can just drill straight through acrylic of different thicknesses and uh, you don't get the kind of explosive cracking when the material, when the drill bit breaks through the back of the material. Um, highly recommend acrylic specific drill bits. And then for the construction method, everything was welded together. Um, so wood shop materials uh, in the, oh, the whole model's parametric. The pump is a off the shelf, uh, like coolant pump meant for BMW uh, cars, which oh, reduces cost and makes it more widely available. Um, we use uh, as more of a qualitative um, sensor, one of these uh, flow meters that are really designed for like garden hose and garden hose systems and things like that. And then um, in the documentation for this, there is full build guides that show how to align, how to glue, how to clamp the, uh, the components that make up this flume. Um, so I think that the paper for this was recently published um, in Hardware X. So you can please go check out our paper. But with the limited time we have left, I think that y'all would appreciate a lab tour. So if I may switch back to the phone camera. Yay. Um, so here's a tour of our lab space. Uh, this is our electronics and electrical engineering area. So kind of a standard setup. One fun feature is this, um, this soldering station that we designed, um, which has integrated fume extraction. So when you're soldering, and hopefully this comes through, when you're soldering and the solder makes smoke, it just gets sucked straight under and away. And this was all built with a laser cut MDF. Um, we have a maker space. So pretty much everything that you've seen today with the exception of the, the table saw flume was built using these tools. So tabletop, bandsaw and drill press, uh, resin printers, we have both the forms and then a, a less expensive LEGU printer. Um, a uh, laser cutter. We very recently got a desktop CNC machine and are, are still finding uses for it in the lab. Um, a 3D printer. And then that's kind of what we got. Um, some other things that we've implemented in the lab are having our own personal hardware store. Um, so this has been really great to just have everything that you need to to put an experiment together in house. And that includes uh, sheet goods for the laser cutter, um, aluminum extrusions for building uh, larger structures and um, other materials. So yeah, maybe I can open it up to questions if there's, if there's anything, unless there's anything else that we wanna cover. We have uh, a question that came in a little bit, a, a little while ago. Oh, hello. Sorry. <laughs> we do have a question that came in um, from Jay. He was wondering how many milliliters is the droplet on the... <laughs> oh, this is a, this is a Dan question <laughs> or a Chase question. 
Well, what's the how big is the drop? Chase like? that chase down. Chase. <laughs> oh, chase is gone. <laughs> how dare um, I'm gonna assume small, very few, if any. Well, okay, Little. one millimeter is a cubic centimeter. So yeah, so right, a, a milliliter is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, one one centimeter cubed. So these are on the order of millimeters or smaller. So it'll be less than a a, a microliter actually, um, but could be even even smaller. Wow, mm. that's very small. That is a teeny tiny little droplet. <laughs> yeah. Well, the smallest ones we could build or that we printed were with 200 micron um so 0.2 millimeter nozzles from the the standard 3d printers and you can barely see those by eye so we weren't sure it was working until we put the the camera to it and we could actually we could actually see them that makes sense that's wild yeah so if people want to know more about the lab or maybe they want to collaborate or something how can they reach you folks well, the, the best way is um, through our website. So there's a number of channels there. So my my um, contact information is there as well as everyone's um, information, including um, Eli's. Um, we also have a um, active account on uh, X, I guess, formerly, formerly Twitter. Um, and so I see y'all are active on that as well. So we try to share all of our projects um, through that um, source as well, as well as our, our website. So that's probably the best um, place to start. That's a great thing Amazing. to note. I will drop that in here. Thank you guys so much. This was amazing. There's so many different really wild projects and uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time to walk us through the lab. Yeah, gorgeous lab. Thank many you have, for your interest. That is, that it's a great setup in there and it's a beautiful lab and they're right. It looks amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to have y'all. Thanks for the cool. opportunity. Yeah, great to, to see you. Lee and Sid, hopefully see you at the next uh, Open Harbor Summit. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would love that. Yeah. Come to Edinburgh with us. <laughs> Bye. 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 Pay for Eli to come to Edinburgh. <laughs> it's in the works. We're, uh, we're working on some university uh, travel grants. Hopefully, hopefully we can make it happen. Sounds great. Can't wait. Okay.